needed, uh, that have needed the cleansing and healing effect. So now we have three scriptures. Three scriptures there. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Let's see if we can pick up what agent the antibiotic of the Word of God is administered to our sin-sick souls. It says, in Him you also trusted after you heard what? The Word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with what? The Holy Spirit. Hmm. Let's go on to the next scripture before we comment. It says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay, so here we see a common thread beginning here. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. So it didn't just come with the word of God, but it came with what? The power of the Holy Spirit. All right. Number D, 2D. God's Spirit works intimately with the Word of God to purify, cleanse, and save mankind from the life threatening infection of sin. As the Apostle Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13, and this is the scripture I chose for this morning's study. It's so beautiful. It says, God from the beginning chose you for salvation through what? Through the sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. So the question we ask ourselves this morning, how often do we pick up the Bible and just read it because we know it's a good thing to do? But we don't wait on the Holy Spirit to actually implant it inside of us. And how many times do we pray for the Holy Spirit to lead us and, and hope that He'll take us in a direction and we don't have the guidance of the Holy Spirit? We don't have these, these two working intimately and intricately together. You see, the antibiotic needs a carrying agent in order for it to, to penetrate the wound, in order for it to be... In, used inside of a sin-sick soul. So recently, um, I put a, a, a toolbox together in order to tidy up the mess in my garage. And uh, I put all the same little nuts and bolts together in little compartments, and this was a great toolbox which had lots of little compartments that kind of flopped over from either side, and then you put them in, you know, and you clip it closed, and you put it back. And when it was all loaded, it fell off the shelf. It was so heavy, and it crashed the whole corner of the toolbox. Oh, and I thought, oh, man, <laughs> all that work, what do I do? Do I just keep it with a big hole in the side? No, the, some of the stuff will fall out. Then I had an idea. In Home Depot, they sell an epoxy resin that you can buy off the shelf. It comes in a, in a, in a syringe that's, that's kind of molded together with two spouts. Have you seen what? You know, have you seen that? And it's got two agents in it that when you push the syringe, these two agents come out separately and you catch it onto a little a piece of cardboard or something and you mix it together. Have you used that? Well, I had to squeeze out the whole syringe, and I had to mix it, and I, I patched together this hole with the epoxy resin. But now, if I had taken just one of the agents and put it on, do you think it would have hardened and worked? No. If I had taken just the other one, but my friends, sometimes we do that as Christians. We... Minimalize the impact that God has provided for us 
through the Spirit of truth. And Jesus specifically calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of truth. When I send the Spirit of truth to you, He will guide you into all truth. And so this, this precious agent that God has provided for us, this, this antibiotic against sin, comes to us as a precious treasure that we can utilize and that we can administer. And so in number three, the antibiotic that kills sin is a hidden treasure. In this week's study, hidden, hidden treasure, Jesus tells the story about a man who is plowing a field, and the blades of his plow strike a treasure box. He quickly covers it up again and goes and sells. Your next word is all. He sells all he has and buys a field so that he can own the treasure. My friends, the question we ask ourselves this morning is, is the Bible, the Word of God, Blended with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Is it a treasure to us? Is it something that we have discovered that is so precious to us that we will lose everything for it? Well, if it isn't, maybe it's not working. Maybe we are trying the one and it's not working and we're trying the other one and it's not working. And so we kind of push it aside as if it's just part of what church people do. It's part of what we do to feel good about ourselves. Maybe a legalistic obligation that we do because the preacher says we should do it or because we've heard it in our Sabbath school classes. So what does this treasure represent? Let's go to our books now. Page 39, the left-hand column, the second paragraph. Page 39, the left-hand paragraph, the second paragraph there that starts with, this is the treasure. You got it? Remember, everyone has a book, and this you take home with you. It's your personal gift from the Orange Cove Church. What does this treasure represent? It says, this is the treasure that is found in the Scriptures. The Bible is God's lesson book, His great educator. The foundation of all true science is contained in the Bible. Every branch of knowledge that may be found by searching the Word of God. And above all else, it contains the science of all sciences. And what is that? The science of salvation. The Bible is the mind of unsearchable riches of Christ. The true higher education is gained by studying and obeying the Word of God, but when God's Word is laid aside for books that do not lead to God and the kingdom of heaven, the education acquired is a perversion of the name. So what is the treasure? The precious treasure is the Word of God. All right, so now let's go to the next reading from our chapter. We go to page 40, the left-hand column. Page 40 in the left-hand column, and that one starts with, the Word of God is to be our study. You got it? All right, the Word of God is to be our study. We are to educate our children in the truths found therein. It is an inexhaustible treasure. But men fail to find this treasure because they do not watch, sorry, search until it is within their possession. Very many are content with a supposition in regard to the truth. They are content with a surface work, taking it for granted that they have all the essential, sorry, all that is essential. 
They take the sayings of others for truth, being too indolent to put themselves to diligent, earnest labor, represented in the word as digging for hidden treasure. But man's inventions are not only unreliable, they are dangerous, for they place man where God should be. They, they place the sayings of men where as thus saith the Lord should be. So the question we ask ourselves this morning, my friends, is why do so, people, so few people study the Word of God? If it is truly a hidden treasure, if it is truly the power of God to save, what does Paul say there in 2 Thessalonians? Oh man, I love this scripture. Um, he says in 2 Thessalonians 2.13 on page 2, where we read this, God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. So our salvation is dependent on the ministry of God's Spirit through His Word. It's a huge thing. But why do so few people study the Word of God? There are churches where people don't even study the Word of God at all. The priest or the pastor tells them what to believe, and they actually trust him to do that. Could it be, this is number 3D, could it be that the enemy of our souls knows that the Word of God ministered to us by God's Spirit can save us from the life-threatening bacteria of sin? Could it be that the enemy, your next word is the enemy, wants to minimize the important of, importance of the Word of God and push it to the bottom of our priority lists. Last week we spoke about the fact that believers should congregate wherever the Word of God is opened. And that whether it's Dwight Nelson or Doug Batchelor, or whether it's a young child that opens the Word of God and reads it, that we believe that the Spirit of God brings it to us personally and customizes it to our hearts. And it doesn't matter if we've been in the church for, for three years or 30 years, but when a passage of Scripture is opened, the Holy Spirit reveals new truth to us. And so people will say, well, I prefer this form of gathering. And another one will say, I prefer that form of gathering. But my friends, wherever the Word of God is opened, the Holy Spirit has something to say to you. And the Holy Spirit has something to say to me. I don't want to be doing anything else when the Word of God is opened. I don't want to be distracted with things to do. And uh, Faye and Jasper told me about the, the documentary on Netflix called Brain Games. And for a long time, I thought to myself that I'm the master, a multitasker. I can drive on in my car with my headset on, talk on the phone, I'm eating my sandwich, and I'm driving, thinking I'm, I'm accomplishing a lot. And the same way when I'm talking on the phone, you know, I'll be sitting on my computer and doing something, and people saying, Pastor, are you there? Pastor, are you there? Well, I want to thank Faye and Jasper for pointing me to um, Brain Games, because Brain Games teaches you that you can only do one thing at a time. You might think you're a, a multitasker. Let me, have got news for you. Then you're not part of the human race because the human brain can focus on one thing and one thing only. So now when someone calls me, I take out a blank sheet of paper and I start taking notes so that I will concentrate because I'm an I'm a, I'm a A-type personality who, who, who wants to accomplish all the time. You know, and people will minimize church 
and the church service, and they will say, well, you know, I, I have a discussion group that I go to with my men, and I prefer to have this discussion group. And another person will say, well, you know, I go to a Christian concert, and I listen to Christian music there. I don't really need church. My friends, let me tell you, the church service is a time when you can take everything else out of your mind and you can focus on one thing and one thing only. And that is, what is God saying to you? And yes, there's a preacher speaking, but the preacher is opening the Word of God. And if he doesn't, he shouldn't be up on the, uh, near the pulpit at all. The Word of God is opened and he breaks it down so that whoever's listening can hear the different, the different variations of what the Word of God is actually saying. And something that the preacher says can kick off a line of thinking that can connect with something in the listener's life, something in the Word of God. And remember, the Spirit of God must always be present. Now, if I'm distracted with something and I'm doing this and I'm running here and I'm listening in my car or I, I, I'm doing something else, is the Spirit able to get me where I'm focused and when I'm listening and I'm paying intent, att attention? No. Because my brain can only focus on one thing at a time. Just one. So, you know what your time is like with the Word of God. You know whether the enemy has gotten to you to minimalize the importance of the Word of God. You know if you wait on the Holy Spirit to explain the Word of God to you. You know. You know whether this, this, this powerful inoculating agent against sin is powerful and effective in your life or not. My friends, we've got to stand against the enemy who is trying to minimize the word, of, the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, who together crush the hold of sin on our lives who together inoculize this, this stubborn, selfish, self-centered, self-sufficient, sinful nature. We want to do God's things our way. When it suits us, the way we think best. But the Word of God arrests us and takes our sinful natures by the scruff of the neck and says, no, this is the way. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44, let me show you what happens when a person comes and sits silently, ready to hear the Word of God and ready to be ministered to by the Holy Spirit. Let me show you. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44, and this is what I pray for every time. When we come into a worship service, it says, And while Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. So if I'm sitting in the audience or in the congregation and I'm busy flipping through the Facebook uh, posts, is the Holy Spirit going to fall on me? If I'm sitting in the service and I'm looking at my watch and I'm thinking, man, I wonder when my friend's going to call me. Our brain can only do one thing at a time. And my friends, for once a week, God is calling His people to come together and open the Word and pray for our brains to be focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is to hear the Word of God and to accept it into the inner archives of our beings through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And you see, studying the Bible, 
It's such a simple thing. Oh, yeah, I study the Bible. I read here and there. But, you know, what is the Bible anyway? So the enemy tends to dilute everything. He, he tends to bring in compromise, and he tends to make it of no significance to us. And he gets us focusing on everything else. But the simplicity, and that's why we speak about primitive godliness. Primitive godliness means that I believe that this is the inspired Word of God and that I don't care if I'm in the United States of America, the land of plenty. I don't care if I'm in Iraq, in a little, uh, huddled away in a little hole, but if I have the Word of God with me and I open it and I drink from it with hunger and thirst, that I am fed from the very throne room of heaven. Primitive godliness. Primitive godliness that this is the Word of God by which the heavens were formed, that this is the word of God that rose up the dead, and that if I will take it and I will piece by piece break it off and realize and pray for the Holy Spirit to reveal it to me, each word will feed my inner soul and bring healing to the brokenness. We complain we are miserable. Life is so hard. And the, the word, the, this treasure chest is bursting with promises from God that I am with you even to the end of the world. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He's a father to the fatherless. He will bring the orphan and the widow in, into homes. He promises that we should not worry about tomorrow because he feeds the birds of the air and he clothes the lily of the field. My friends, this is the treasure chest. How much are we taking it? The parable that Jesus told in this beautiful little parable is that the man who struck treasure realized that that treasure was worth more than anything else in his whole life. And he went and sold all he had so he could have that treasure. And here it is. Are you prepared to do the same? Primitive godliness. We have all kinds of fancy, sophisticated innovations in the Christian world. We've got churches that are as big as malls. We've got big bands playing inspirational music, we've got lights, we've got media, we've got television screens, we've got all kinds of things that the world has to entertain the people. But the question I have is, where's the primitive godliness? Where is the silence where we just sit and drink at the fountain and say, oh God, feed me, just me and you, under a tree somewhere in an open area where it's silent. That is what we need. That's what we were created for. That is what our souls long for. Forget about the bells and whistles. Forget about the fancy stuff. That's nice once you've been fed. That's nice once you're full of the Word of God and the Spirit is in you. And you can go into a place like that and you can look for the lonely people around them and you can minister to them. But when we're looking to constantly be fed and constantly be entertained, we're on the wrong track. Because, my friends, in the end time, only the Spirit of the living God working through His Holy Word is going to carry us through. I mean, we've had this little, these parables around us for how long? Simple. Down to earth. But how many of us Study the Word of God. How many of us dissect the Word of God? How many of us go into the Word of God and we will not leave until we've felt the, experienced the feeding to our hungry, parched souls? How many of us? Very, very few. Oh, the church doesn't do this. Oh, the pastor doesn't do this. Oh, the deacons don't do that. Oh, look at this. Look at that. Shut up and get into the Word. 
Get into the Word. Become a true disciple. Follow Jesus Christ and you'll find that the poor pastor, the poor deacons, and everyone else in the church are doing just great because you'll be right there alongside them pulling your weight because you'll be filled with this, this healing agent that suppresses the distractions of the enemy, minimalizing the power of God's Word. Parents, are you spending a morning and an evening worship with your children? Are you feeding your child physical food, but are you feeding them the spiritual food? These parables of Jesus are absolutely beautiful. They tell a story. They've got a message. But our sophisticated life has distracted us with so many things. And we're constantly on the run. And I'm as guilty as anyone else. Number E, page three. Page three of number three. Could it be that the enemy works tirelessly at hiding this life-saving treasure from people so they can, by default, continue down the slippery slope to eternal destruction? Or if he can't hide it from them to make the study of Scripture a spiritless exercise that people check off their things-to-do lists, could it be that the enemy understands the redemptive power, your next word, of the Word of God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit so much better than we do? Quite a question, isn't it? So James says, in James 1 verse 21, he says, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness what? The implanted word which is able to save your souls. My friends, that is powerful. The implanted word. I don't want a theory. I don't want to just know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as a historical fact. I don't just want to know about King David and his life. I want the word implanted in me so that it becomes part of my being. You know what Peter says? He says, when you speak, speak the very oracles of God. When I open my mouth with Andre's brain in control, be, be very afraid. Because what comes out of there is a sinful nature language that you don't want to hear. So imagine if we really believed that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. What if that Word was implanted in us and it became our second nature, or rather our first nature, so that when I speak... I speak the very oracles of God. Because any one of us cannot be trusted. So I ask you, is the word of God implanted in you? And the implanting happens through the Holy Spirit. Number F, are you and I being lured into hypnotic state where we don't realize how crucial the implanted word is to our salvation? Are we so content and comfortable living in a land, your next word, of plenty? Top of page four, your word is plenty. That we have completely missed that which can save us from the life-threatening infection called sin. Turn to page 41. Right-hand column, second and third paragraphs. Page 41 the very last little segment of the, the paragraph down the bottom there. You got it? 
We need the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Page 41. Uh, yes, sorry, that's, the, that's not the one. Okay, it's left-hand column, second and third paragraphs. But there must be earnest study and close investigation. Sharp, clear perceptions of truth will never be the reward of indolence. Can you feel your hands being slapped? No earthly blessing can be obtained without earnest, patient, persevering effort. If men attain success in business, they must have a will to do and a faith to look for results. And we cannot expect to gain spiritual knowledge without earnest toil. Those who desire to find the treasures of truth must dig for it as a miner digs for the treasure hidden in the earth. No half-hearted, indifferent work will avail. It is essential for old and young not only to read God's word, but to study it with wholehearted earnestness, praying and searching for truth as for hidden treasure. Those who do this will be rewarded, for Christ will quicken the understanding. Our salvation depends on a knowledge of the truth contained in the Scriptures. There it is. It is God's will that we should possess this. Search, oh search, the precious Bible with hungry hearts. Explore God's Word as a miner explores the earth to find the veins of gold. Never give up the search until you have ascertained your salvation to God and His will regard, with, uh, in regard to you. Christ declared, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Yet, if he shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. I will do it. Number 4a, Jesus tells the parable of the hidden treasure to demonstrate how crucial it is to let go of everything in the world in order to gain eternal treasures. The parable tells us there is one thing and one thing only that is of value. Your next word is value. And that is salvation that leads to eternal life. Jesus teaches the same lesson through the parable of the wise and foolish builders in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. You see, Jesus does hardly speaks without telling a story. So nice. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the flood came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on what? The rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them is likened unto a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. My friends, the life and teachings of Jesus are the rock on which each of us, your next word there is the rock, on which each one of his followers is to build their lives. How many people are calling themselves Christians and are not building their lives on the rock? They go to Christian events, they attend church, they participate in Christian outreaches, but are they digging into the word of God as if their lives depended upon it? As we can see all around us, the storms are severe. As we can see all around us, the floods are rising and the fires are raging. And not just in the physical world, right? The question is, is your house built on the rock? Or is your house built on the sand? 
I think I might have told you guys a little while ago, when I lived in the Florida Keys, I heard about Hurricane Charlie that was coming around. And I kept watching the news, I kept watching the news. And the news kept saying that, the, that Hurricane Charlie was going to go south and it was going to skirt the Florida Keys, but, you know, probably be 20 miles out to sea. So living in the Florida Keys, you kind of become a little hardened like the conks. You know what a conk is? A conk is someone that has lived in the Keys for a long time, who was born and raised there. And the conks will say, nah, Hurricane Charlie, nah, nah, it's going far down, don't worry about it. So I thought to myself, nah, I'm not going to worry about it. And the apartment where I was living obviously had storm shutters, and they were outside the window um, under concrete blocks. And so I thought I'll just leave it, and I went to sleep that night. Well, about four o'clock in the morning, the wind was howling. And I could hear things hitting buildings. And, and I looked outside the window, and I just saw palm trees bent over and leaves blowing and chaos. Hurricane Charlie had jogged a little north. <laughs> and my storm shutters were not on. And the rain was pelting down and was hitting the window and the wind was banging against the door, and oh, it was a nightmare, and I just thought, I just saw in my mind's eye, I just saw someone's garden chair come crash through my window and just bring in rain and destroy my computers and flood my apartment. I made a resolve, never again. I don't care what the news says, if there's a hurricane coming anywhere close, I'm going to have my storm shutters up. And now, if, you, if a storm comes near Jacksonville, you'll drive down Ambrosia Drive, and guess who will have the only one that will have storm shutters up? <laughs> Imoa. My friends, in the spiritual context, burrowing ourselves in the Word of God, asking for the Holy Spirit's illumination, is getting ready for the storm. It's building our house on the solid rock. Do not be caught with your house on the sand. Take time. I can tell you, I remember back when I was single, when I was living in South Africa, and I went through a traumatic breakup. My heart was broken. My parents were here in the United States. I was the only one in this little town. I've told you this before. That's what converted me. But I remember having to open my fitness center at 5 in the morning. At 3.30, I was up. Paul, paying through the word of God. Hungry and thirsting. And, and my, my broken heart was so ministered to by God's word, I clung to his promises. I wrote out the scriptures that ministered to me on little cards. I kept them in my pocket. Every time my heart broke, I'd take that card out and I'd read God's word and it would give me assurance. My friends, are we living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God? Or are we living on the philosophies and the fantasies of mankind? Are we leaning into our own understanding? Are we trying to work out this, this dilemma called life? Are we trying to work it out in our own strength? Or are we rooted and grounded deep, deep, deep? Not just with a superficial reading, but with the Holy Spirit's presence. Where we wait for the Holy Spirit like the disciples in the upper room waited. Do we have time before we rush out the door into the frenzied traffic to just wait on God's Spirit and pray for that feeding of our souls? My friends, if we want boldness and confidence in this life amidst the storms, we need to return to primitive godliness. doesn't take much. It takes a quiet place with the Holy Bible and asking and inviting the Holy Spirit to fill that place. That is church.
Turn to page 41. We're going to close with a beautiful passage that summarizes the partnership between God's Spirit and the Word of God. Page 41, right at the bottom of the page, the last little piece of the paragraph there. We need the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Do you have it? Page 41, right at the bottom, the last little piece of the paragraph, the bulk is on, the, on page 42. We need the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit in order to discern the truths in God's Word. The lovely things of the natural world are not seen until the sun, dispelling the darkness, floods them with its light. So the treasure in the Word of God are not appreciated until they are revealed by the bright beams of the sun of righteousness. The Holy Spirit, sent from heaven by the benevolence of the infinite love, takes the things of God and reveals them to every soul that has an implicit faith in Christ. By His power, the vital truths upon which the salvation of the soul depends are impressed upon the mind and the way of life is made so plain that none need err therein. As we study the scriptures, we should pray for the light of God's Holy Spirit to shine upon the word that we may see and appreciate its treasures. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for every person who came to be present when your word is opened. And Father, today I, I pray that the message of the hidden treasure will draw a line in the sand in each one of our lives. Father, we ask for forgiveness for being so distracted and allured by stupid things and minimiz minimizing the crucial impact of your holy word. Father, today we realize how important primitive godly is. Primitive, private, and personal. Us and you, so that you can fill us through the ministry of your Spirit and the passages of the holy, inspired Word of God. And so in the quietness of this morning hour, with no one looking around, and every head bowed and every eye closed, my friends, if you want to make a decision this morning that God's Word in tandem with the Holy Spirit is going to be your first priority, just raise up your hands. I want primitive godliness. I want to shun everything that has caused me to, to veer from that. Thank you. Father, you've seen our hearts. You've seen our hands. It is our prayer this morning that we will personally, individually be connected to heaven's very throne room and that we will hear your still small voice saying, this is the way, walk he in it. And that from this day forward, we will have boldness and confidence in a, in a stormy world Is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen.